And what we have is a sad event. The great king, King Uzziah, who'd reigned for 52 years, has just died. Um, Second Chronicles chapter 26. If you'll just read that one chapter, you get us a brief synopsis of his reign. And, and it'll show that for the most part, Uzziah sought the Lord. And as a consequence, he was blessed and the nation was blessed. But, and this is so tragic because it happens so frequently, towards the end of his life, his pride took over and it led to his downfall. It happens when people have power. Kings have power and they think they can do anything and pride comes in. So what did he do? He was intentional. It was deliberate. He knew what he was doing. He went into the temple to burn incense on the altar of incense. And he was not allowed to do that. Now, it took incredible courage. These kings had a lot of power. But 81 priests stand up against the king and say, you've got to leave the sanctuary. What you've done is wrong. And Uzziah gets angry. Don't, who are you to talk to me like that? I'm the king. He gets really shoved off of them. He rages against them. He is unrepentant. And as he's raging, we're told, God steps in. We tend to forget that God's in command and God's everywhere. And he strikes King Uzziah with leprosy. And at that point, he's now made ceremonially unclean, so he has to leave the temple. And I suspect he was pretty eager to go. That's not a thing you hang around for. So this was an extremely powerful, very scary, visible warning to everyone that even the king is not to mess with a holy God. There's the warning, isn't it? In his pride as king, he presumed he could do whatever he wanted, but temple sacrifices were not part of his prerogative. King Saul, the first king, he made a very similar error. We continue to make the same mistakes today. We have this idea that just because I'm good in one thing means I'm good at another thing. Just because I can do this, I can do that. Just because God's blessed me in that, I can do everything. And it can be a big problem. A successful business leader, and we should be praying for our business leaders, doesn't mean that they'll be a proficient engineer. They're different fields. A top athlete, and yeah, we're following the Olympics, doesn't automatically mean they're a medical expert. A faithful pastor won't necessarily be a great politician. Okay, we need to understand those things. Okay, so let's go to our passage. It's the sixth chapter in this great book named after Isaiah. And let's just get the pronunciation right, my friends. It is Isaiah. He speaks as an Englishman. All right. But actually, it's the beginning of his ministry. This is the moment when he was commissioned and called by the Lord to be a prophet to the nation of Judah uh, under the nation of Israel. And as we've seen, it happened in the year that King Uzziah died. And everybody in the country, make no bones about this, everyone in the country knew what had happened to Uzziah when he unlawfully went into the temple. And everybody knew you do not mess with the Lord. He's the Holy One. Everybody knew that. So I want you to now put yourselves in Isaiah's shoes and imagine the sheer terror that is coursing through his veins when he finds himself in the temple. He's like, whoa, I didn't be here. People get leprosy when they shouldn't be here. Okay, this is terrifying. And this is not the temple that Solomon built. This is the heavenly temple. It is far greater. It is way grander. It is infinitely more awesome. And the center of this temple on the throne is not a human high priest. It is the Lord himself. We read high and exalted, majestic, and frankly, massive. This, this is God towering over Isaiah, filling the temple with his glorious presence. If Uzziah, the king, was struck with leprosy for his misdemeanor in a temple made with human hands, what fate awaited Isaiah in this perfect heavenly temple? A temple inhabited by the Lord, a temple where the, the Lord's glory, we told, flows from that 
to cover the whole earth, a temple where the, the seraphim are praising him with such fervency and such power that their voices shook the pillars right down to the very foundations. You know, whatever else we take away from this classic Old Testament chapter, let's not miss the main point. The Lord Almighty is holy, holy, holy. He's never to be trifled with. He's never to be presumed upon, overlooked, reduced to a, a comfortable, bland, innocuous pushover. You know, it seems to me that way too many Christians, let alone people who aren't following Jesus, have actually a pathetic God who's so small they boxed him up, who in, in, in their mind readily accommodates their sinfulness and immaturity and immorality and unethical self-centered rebelliousness. That is not the God that we read about here. Now note the four stages that Isaiah experiences with God. The first stage, sight. He saw the Lord, verses one through four. We've just read a great king has left this throne on earth. And, and it could mean, my goodness, what is going to happen next? But the great news is that the greatest king was still seated on the throne in heaven. And every symbol in Isaiah's vision is significant. We need to understand that there's great similarities, sadly, between Judah, Israel in those days and Canada today. Both have become complacent. All of Israel needed to be shaken by a vision of the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, with his train, the robe, filling the temple. Each of the symbols, the title Lord, the throne, the lofty position, this all-encompassing robe, they all reinforced the sovereignty of the Lord God over his universe, over all its kings, over all the nations, over all the peoples, including his chosen people, Israel. Now, for young Isaiah, and he's young at this point, as I said, the outlook looked bleak. The, 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 the king had died. He was a great king. The nation was in peril, and he felt like we so often feel. I can see the problem, but there's nothing I can do about it. What can I do about this? It's out of control. But in the spiritual realms, he saw that the things were unchanged and glorious. God was still on the throne. He was still reigning as sovereign of his universe. From heaven's point of view, the whole earth was still full of his glory. When your world, when my world tumbles in, as it inevitably does, it's good to look at things from heaven's viewpoint. It's so good to remind ourselves, dad's on the throne. Daddy's on the throne and he hasn't abdicated his responsibilities. But sovereignty is not actually the primary revelation, as we've seen, of God's character in Isaiah's vision. First and foremost, it is the holiness of the Lord that Isaiah senses. Sovereignty, if you want to define it, is the powerful nature of God. Holiness is the moral character of God. They go together. But God is pure. God is complete. God is whole. And holiness is the only attribute of God that is presented in the superlative. Unlike the Beatles, and I like the Beatles, but unlike the Beatles, the angels do not sing love, love, love. Nor for that matter do they sing justice, justice, justice. You know what they sing and they only sing? Holy, holy, holy. That's what they sing. And the posts of the temple shirk and the temple is amazing and the presence of God is there and it's tangible because God is holy in all of his being and he's glorious in all of his doing. So the first thing, Isaiah had sight. He saw the Lord. But the second thing, Isaiah had insight. He saw himself. In God's holy and awesome presence, that's when our holiness begins. That's the only place it can begin, with the Holy One. 
the command from the Lord, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, be holy because I am holy, is not optional. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Our Heavenly Father being holy wants His children to be holy as well, just like Him. Wants us because that's the best for us. So the sight of the Holy God and the sound of this holy hymn of worship and brought great conviction to Sorry, folks, not quite sure what happened there. I will get it fixed. Seems that we've lost them completely. I have to get them to reconnect. Sorry, folks. So what's happened is during all of the confusion and all of the craziness out there, someone managed to accidentally unplug the laptop that is running the service. So, so they've now plugged it in and we're just, oh, here they come. We're just waiting for it to have enough charge to be able to turn it back on. So, <laughs> so Josh you, is now Great. reconnected. So we should have you in just a moment. In Peter's spiritual that. growth and maturity. There we go. Good. Thanks. Jesus preparing him Enjoy. for humble leadership. Thanks, now hear this. Please hear this. This is always the case for everyone. There are no exceptions to this rule. No one can bypass this moment of revelation. And if you're sitting here going like, I've never had that, uh, this should be a wake-up moment. If you've never had that, if you've never experienced the pure, blinding holiness of God, if you've never experienced and acknowledged the dark, awful sinfulness inside of you, then you haven't understood the horror of the chasm between you and God. And, and, and you haven't understood the dire situation that you are in. That's the negative side. You've got no grasp of that, but you've also got no grasp and no comprehension of the wonder of the sacrifice of Jesus for you on the cross, of the loving mercy and the amazing grace of a holy God who chooses to forgive and cleanse and purify us. That's the beauty that you've missed out on. You know what Jesus says to Peter when he's done that, go away from me, Lord. 
he turns to Peter and he says, Simon Peter, don't be afraid. <laughs> we should be terrified. We should be terrified. And, and he says to Pete, don't, don't be afraid. Why not? Because the love of God brought him to this planet and sent him to that cross and meant that he would himself choose to descend to the uttermost depth of our most heinous depravity and identify himself with our most awful deeds because nothing is secret from him. You don't take it by surprise. I can't tell you that, Lord. I know already. What? And I still love you. Huh? And why did he do that? To pay for them in full himself, to redeem all who come to him and call on his name. I will never forget the first time that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was with a bunch of other people. The Holy Spirit came on all of us. He does that, by the way. And, and there were people dancing and there were people laughing and there were people praising God. It was heavenly organized chaos. But there was one person in the room who was on his knees and crying his heart out. That was yours truly. I just blubbed like a baby. I had nothing. I was just gone. Why was I like that? Because when the Holy Spirit came upon me, all I saw was my sinfulness. And believe me, it was ghastly. I'd never seen myself. I'm English. I'm pretty good just by being English, aren't we? I I'd never seen that. It was awful. And then someone I didn't know from the United States, turns out, came up to me and he said these words, my son, you're completely forgiven. And the door of my inner prison of guilt and shame was flung open. And for the first time in my life, I was truly free. I was truly free. Because the biggest prison in the world is your inner prison of guilt and shame. And Jesus can open that door. And the Spirit can set you free if you have the wisdom and the humility to confess your sins to a holy God and fall on your knees before a crucified Savior who paid for it all. You know, when we lose sight of the holiness of God, our spiritual sensitivity is dulled. We all need to see that the holiness of God is going to cause us to cry, woe is me, I'm ruined. That's the first hard fact. The second one is this. When Isaiah saw God, he accepted responsibility for his sinfulness. I'm a man of unclean lips. Another translation says, I am a foul-mouthed sinner. He, he, his response didn't allow for exceptions. Didn't, didn't give him permission to shift the blame to someone else. That's what we do now. Everyone's to blame for my mess up. That's what our society is teaching. No, no, I'm to blame for my mess up. Let's grow up, shall we? Let's grow up and acknowledge our sinfulness. How about that? Isaiah acknowledged that he had no place in the presence of a holy God. He had no right to praise him, no right to authority to speak for him. Effectively, he was asking this question, how can I speak for God without a heart like God's? Every preacher, every teacher, every witness of Jesus Christ must ask the same question. If there is sin in our hearts, our lips will betray us. The moment I'm tempted to excuse or explain away my sinfulness, I'll tell you there are thousands there, but one person calls my bluff. His name is Isaiah. He says, Pete, you're bluffing. You did it. So don't blame someone else. In the presence of a holy God, I and I alone am responsible for my unclean lips, and they betray the sinfulness of my heart. And after Isaiah did make that confession of his sinfulness, he went on to say, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So although sinfulness is primarily personal, it always has a social impact. There is corruption at the very heart of every society. There always has been. There always will be because we're in a broken, warped world. The next world won't be. The next life will be brilliant. 
but this is where we are. And the breakdown of personal morality has dreadful social price that impacts everyone negatively. The, hard, the third hard fact, Isaiah accepted his responsibility as a leader, young though he was, as a leader for the sins of his people, because people and leaders, for better or for worse, have influence. He accepted his responsibility. Now, we might ask, why all this emphasis on sinfulness? Why not move on quickly to the anointing and commissioning of Isaiah? Isn't that what this chapter is about? Isn't that what you gave the title of this talk? And the answer lies here, very simply, in the biblical qualifications of leadership in the kingdom of God. In the early church, as it was in Isaiah's time, 740 years before Jesus came, and is today 2,000 years after Jesus, two qualities served as credentials from leadership. Nothing has changed since. The same two qualities. Quality number one, blameless in character, also known as holy. Of course, we're not, but we need to be inviting the Spirit to transform us so we grow. It's called sanctification. And anyone who is a leader or aspiring to leadership needs to let the Holy Spirit help them grow and develop in sanctification. We must be different people than we were six months and a year and three years ago. We cannot be falling for the same sinfulness, the same unforgiveness, the same anger, the same bitterness, or whatever it is. And the second was to be true to the Word of God, the inerrant, unchanging Word of God that we stand firm upon and we say, this word is true. We're not going to dilute it. We're not going to mitigate it. We're not going to miss out the bits we don't like or understand. We're going to say, this is God's word. Amen. And leaders in God's church have to say that or they shouldn't be leaders. So until Isaiah confessed his sinfulness, he was neither ready nor worthy to be called a prophet of the Lord. If our spiritual cleansing is partial, if we haven't honestly acknowledged our sinfulness and sought to be completely forgiven, we're spiritually compromised. We've got one foot still in the world. We've got one foot in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I've already told you that always ends in a mess, in a very uncomfortable position. We will never realize the fulfilling, satisfying, and fruitful life the Father created us for and that Jesus died for. Now, the image of, of, of this transformed life, what happens to Isaiah, is a white hot coal touching his lips. It's graphic, this picture in this chapter. Any doubt of the reality and fatality of human sinfulness is erased by this image of cleansing fire. Isaiah was cleansed, you'll know, not by his own efforts, purely by the grace of God. Only fire from God could take away our guilt. Only the white heat of a live coal from an altar can atone for our sinfulness. The word there, the verb atoned for, means to affect a ransom price. That's what it literally means. It's the price which divine justice requires to cover a sinner's debt. You know, and I, and I, and I just again ask this question uh, because because it's a challenge for those who, who are on the edge of Christianity, questioning it. Uh, where are you in your faith? You see, the live coal from the altar of God reminds us of the love behind the actions of Jesus on the cross, taking away our guilt. It reminds us that the forgiveness that we need came at a huge cost, a cross which extracted no less than the life of the Son of God himself. That's what we remember every time we celebrate a communion, as we will this morning. We share that communion meal. We're remembering a cross and a Savior. That was the live coal. The immediate effect of atonement is reconciliation. Isaiah now heard the Lord's voice. Verse 1 do you remember the Lord was far off, huge, towering? Now, now that Isaiah has been forgiven, he, he can hear the Lord speak and he can talk to him. They're sort of closer. 
It's intimate. Our sins prevent us from hearing the Lord. If we want his guidance, we must first get right with him. We need to confess. We need to be forgiven. Okay, so first Isaiah had sight. Second, he had insight. Third, he had vision. He saw the need, verse 8. And now verse 8 makes it apparent why there's been this emphasis on lips and mouth so prominently in verses 5 through 7. The Lord was seeking a messenger. He's wanting someone to take his message, and Isaiah was now cleansed and ready to be his mouthpiece. The, de the nation desperately needed the Lord, even though the nation didn't realize it, just like our country. And Isaiah volunteered. Unlike Moses, Moses said, here am I, send him. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. It's a classic case of a volunteer, someone who didn't understand the question. But he volunteered. He'd been forgiven. He was amazed. He could hear the Lord. He just said, I don't even know what the task is. I'm in. It's classic, that isn't it? Whatever it is, it's going to be great. I don't want to miss out on the privilege of serving this majestic God. I'm just going to serve him wherever. And don't you feel that? When you met Jesus, when you taste Jesus, don't you feel that way? I know I do. I go, yeah, whatever. Doesn't matter. I'm in. I don't want to miss out. Because with you, it's just infinitely better than without you. So whatever you say, I'm in. Now, most sermons on Isaiah, uh, this, this vision, on Isaiah 6, you know, they stop at this point. They stop at the phrase, here am I, send me. Because there's so much romance in those words. It's so nice. But by stopping too soon, we miss out. And we miss out on the challenging reality of our mission. Because fourth, there was blindness. There was blindness. The nation could not see. Verses 9 to 13. And let's call it these words from God to Isaiah, not the most encouraging words you give to someone at any time in their ministry, particularly at the beginning. All right. God said, go and tell this people the truth, and it will cause them to stop their ears, to close their mouths, and to harden their hearts. Woohoo! That's great. So they're going to continue their rebellion. They're going to refuse to hear, see, and understand, and they won't be healed. Now, those verses, verses 9 to 10, are so important, they are quoted six times in the New Testament. That we should pause and go, whoa, what was it that made them quote them six times? First of all, let's see Isaiah's response. It's very normal. It's anguish. For how long, oh Lord? This is miserable. Why did I volunteer? What's going on? And the Lord answered, until my land is devastated until my people are in exile, until my remnant is disciplined, until the holy seed remains in the stump, uh, is, of, is all that remains of this once mighty oak. And you're like, oh, that was encouraging. That's really heavy. And it sounds pretty hopeless, doesn't it? You're like, really? But what God is saying, this is what happens, nation, when my patience runs out. This is what happens, says the Lord, when I remove my hand of protection from a nation, from a country, from Canada. Amen. This is what happens when the Lord leaves a people to suffer the inevitable consequences of their unholy, sinful lifestyles. It's not pretty, is it? Now be assured, the Lord does not deliberately make sinners blind and deaf and hard-hearted. That happens because the more people resist God's truth, the less able they are to receive his truth. You say no, your heart gets hardened. You say no again, it's harder still. You continue saying no, it becomes like a rock. That's what happens. And it's not good. But with Isaiah, now his heart is beating in time with the Lord's heart. Finally, he's in tune. He's finally equipped to speak for the Lord. And even though he knew that he would not see the prophecies that he uttered fulfilled. He was willing to preach faithfully to this unresponsive audience until the Lord released him. And again, here's another truth, because we love emotional highs, don't we? We love spiritual highs. Isn't that great? Do you remember when? And we were all praising God and jumping up and down. And it was fantastic. And that's fantastic. But you know, when those go and all that remains is you, that is when your faith kicks in. 
That's when your decision to faithfully and devotedly follow the Lord, whatever the cost, and go wherever the Spirit leads, that's when it matters. The test of a ministry is not outward success. That's the world's test. Faithfulness to the Lord. That's the test. The decision to choose to teach the inerrant word of God, to make Jesus known, and to proclaim the life-changing gospel, no matter how people respond. Amen. So the Lord had told Isaiah that his ministry would end in seeming failure, the people off to exile. But just like us, Isaiah still needed hope. And he needed a long-range perspective for his ministry. Otherwise, he'd feel like he accomplished nothing. And there was this slender thread of hope in the last verse. Isaiah was assured that a remnant would survive. It would be like the stump of a, of a fallen tree, which the shoots, it's called there, the holy seed, would come. And they would continue the true faith in the land. Friends, never underestimate what God can do with one willing volunteer. Let alone a whole group of us. There's even greater need today. We've got tremendous opportunities to share the gospel to our lost world, to our lost country. Go and tell is still God's command to his people. And he's waiting for us to reply, to volunteer. Here am I. Send me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for adopting me by grace as your child. In response to your love, I volunteer to serve you wholeheartedly. Father, here am I. Send me. Lord Jesus, thank you for submitting to the Father and dying on the cross for my sins. Today, I choose to follow you and to make your name known to everyone I interact with so that they too might be forgiven and set free. Holy Spirit, thank you for convicting me of my sinfulness. As I submit to your leading, please fill me afresh today. Please cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. Please grow within me your fruit of maturity, and please equip me to live this life to the full. I ask all these things in the name of my Lord and my King, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening.